Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Two Ridges Presbyterian Church. Uh, knowing that you would all want to know about Bill, I emailed him yesterday and said, what do you want me to tell the congregation? And he said, Alan, please tell him I'm doing fine. I have no discomfort. And the incision looks great. He added, because of good local nursing. <laughs> Just have to keep it bandaged until Thursday when I go to have the sutures removed. It was a squam... Squamous? S Squamous? Squamous cell carcinoma removed from the left side of my neck. They got it all and only had to take off two layers of skin. <laughs> Tell everyone thanks for the prayers and see them on the 13th. So, are there any other announcements this morning? Yes. Now, the Lord has blessed us with many, many summer squash. <laughs> And I brought a big bag in the back plus some empty bags. So if anyone wants any summer squash and don't have enough of themselves, feel free to take all they want. Summer squash in the back from the Cimarron Farm. <laughs> Just yes. a reminder that you know the trip to Phipps is this Thursday. If you haven't told me you're going, let me know today. We'll be meeting here at nine o'clock. Looks like we'll have about two carloads. Okay. Anything else? If not, let us come together in silent prayer. Amen. Let us join now in our call to worship, which can be found in your bulletin. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. And as for what others do, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violence. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. In blind your ear to me, hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversities at your right hand. As I shall be, I shall go over the grace and righteousness. When I today by Joe Zamberlin, and I'm sure that uh, you will have more to say about that later. I, I probably will, yeah.
You all may be seated. And like uh, Alan said, Joe picked all the hymns for the service. So um, if you absolutely hate what we're singing, If you absolutely love what we're singing, <laughs> and with Joe, if there's an amen at the end, yeah. we're playing amen. Why? Why? It's a mistake. Let's move on in the. Uh... <laughs> yes, Brother Mike? Yeah, what? When it all came about, there's a misunderstanding about playing all men's at the end. And that's why the new hymnals do not have it in. What do you have to say to that, Joe? Fake news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, Mike, what can I say when you got fake news? You got fake news. I got this <laughs> from the Reverend Dr. Fred Anderson head pastor of Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church. He's the one that told you. He's the one that told you that? Did he wink? <laughs> Later. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm sure that's the case. <laughs> yes. Well, you know what we do? Hey, we'll practice right now. Instead of amen. Let's do amen. All right, we'll do that one time. Ready? Right. Okay, on the count of three. Now, how are we going to do it? Amen. Very good. All right, let's do it. One, two, three. Amen. You didn't think you were going to get into all this, did you? Yeah. Now, remember, remember, he picked them. All right, we're in, at the point of the service where we have the opportunity to uh, raise our uh, uh, sins to God, to confess to Him. Absolutely certain that in Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. Now, since we commit sins not just as individuals, but also as communities, it's right that we pray together, which we'll do with the uh, prayer in the bulletin, and then we'll follow it with just a brief time for individual and personal confession. So, brothers and sisters, as God's people, let's go before God now in prayer. Almighty God, we confess that we have sinned against you. Miracles don't seem to have an important place in the modern world. Sadly, this also applies to Christians. We tend to be more interested in what we think is likely than in what's possible for you. As a result, we fail to appreciate the miraculous all around us. Gracious Lord, forgive us and show us how we might play a role in your miraculous will. Amen. Lord God, in this time that follows, hear now these prayers we lift up to you, and Lord, have mercy upon us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to us and thank you for loving us as much as you do. But right now we want to thank you for not only forgiving us but for cleansing us. And we believe that's what's happened. Because we've lifted these prayers, these confessed these sins in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we now pray. Amen. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, hear the good news of the gospel. This saying is sure and worthy of universal acceptance that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that's good. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand.
You all may be seated. You may have heard Joe complaining about the height of the music. Like everything I had, it's old music. It was the first piece of music that my voice teacher, Helen Elvin, had me buy at the bookstore. So that's why it's big old music. Sorry, Joe. Both of you did a did a really good job, and and my I don't think there was, was there an amen at the end of that. No, no, good. <laughs> uh, the scripture passage this morning is from the 14th chapter of Matthew, beginning with the 13th verse. Now, if you've got your Bibles with you, and that's always a good idea to have your Bibles in church, you might want to read along. If not, I want you to feel free to use the pew Bibles. Hear now the word of God as written by the evangelist Matthew. When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there to a a deserted place by himself. And when the crowds heard, they followed him on foot from the towns. And after he went out, he saw a great crowd, and he was touched by them, and and he cured their sick. But when early evening came, the disciples came to him, saying, 
The place is deserted and the hour is already passed. Release the crowd. So, so they might go into the villages and buy for themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they have need, no need to go. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we, we don't have anything except five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them to me. And after he'd ordered the crowds to recline upon the grass, he took the five loaves and two fish, and after he looked into the heavens, he blessed them. And after he broke them, he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And everyone ate and was satisfied. And they took what was left over, 12 wicker baskets full of broken pieces. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, not including women and children. Amen. Praise God for this reading from his word. This morning, we are going to talk about miracles. And you know, I, 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 when you think about it, this is probably an outstanding Topic, because it seems to me that we here in America have a, a rather odd, almost contradictory position on miracles. I mean, I want you to just think about that for, for a little bit. On one hand, we are all rational people, right? We are all rational people. And we trust in science and technology, right? And miracles, well, they don't really fit into this nice, neat, rational, and reasonable world that we've created. Now, do they? I mean, we're rational people. Where do miracles fit into this? Now, I've got to tell you, this is not a new point of view. As a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson wrote a translation of the Gospels. You, you know that? Thomas Jefferson wrote a translation of the Gospels, only he excluded anything that he considered supernatural. So this is not a new position, but we have taken it much further, haven't we? And I'm talking about we in the faith. We've even it, taken it to the point where we believe we're supporting Scripture. We are defending God's Word by using history and science and reason to prove that it's true. As though God's Word can't be true unless it conforms to our sense of rationality. Let's face it, miracles just don't fit into a world defi defined solely by reason. On the other hand, though, for a society that frankly feels sort of uncomfortable with this whole concept of the miraculous, we sure use the word a lot in our world, don't we? Good night, nurse. And I say that for Alan. Good night, nurse, in sports alone. How often have you heard the outcome of a game or even a great play to be a miracle? And with the Winter Olympics just a few months away, we all remember the what? Miracle on ice, right? I think I'm pretty safe in saying that every time an underdog wins or a superior performance is given, we'll be witness to another miracle. You see what I mean? As a society, even as modern American Christians, we have this odd relationship with the whole idea of miracles. And I'll tell you, for me, that's a good reason for us to spend a little while this morning talking about them this morning, especially in light of the passage we just read from Matthew. Because, you know, I think there are three things we can be safe in saying about miracles. And I'm talking about based on what Jesus did with those 5,000 folks. One, we could say that miracles still happen. And that they happen all around us all the time. That's one. And two, we still have a role to play in them. And I'm talking about you and me. In other words, God still uses us to accomplish His will, even when that will involves the miraculous. That's two. And three, to play that role, to be involved in the miracle. Well, we really have to make a few decisions ourselves. 
Decisions that when push comes to shove will really determine whether we're going to become a part of the miracle or not. Now that's what we're going to be dealing with. And, my, and in my opinion, based on this story, those are three things about miracles we can say are true right here and now. But let me elaborate a little bit on it. Like I said, I think first we can say with all kinds of confidence that miracles still happen. Miracles still happen. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why they still happen. It's because God is still in charge and He still cares about us. I'll tell you, He still has compassion for the world He created and the people He made to care for. In other words, in spite of how tough things seem to be, he still loves his children. He still loves us. And you know, I believe that's pretty clear in the passage we just read. I mean, I want you to think about what, what's going on here. Jesus has just gotten some horrible news. Came right before the scripture we read. John the Baptist has just been beheaded by Herod Antipas. And in light of that news, the news Jesus just got, he wanted to get away by himself, right? That was what he wanted to do right at the beginning of his passage. Now, I don't know about you, but his wanting to get away, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, good night nurse, again for Alan. Our president is taking a 17-day seven day vacation for crying out loud at his golf resort. I guess Jesus needed some private time himself. Not to play golf, but certainly to pray and to think and to just relax. But as soon as they heard he was gone, what did the crowds do? Well, Matthew wrote, they followed him on foot from the tank. Bless their hearts, they're like the paparazzi, they can't leave him alone. Now I'll tell you something, if it had been me and I was trying to get in the way and all these people were following me, which used to happen a lot when I was single, um, <laughs> but only in my dreams, I would have been really ticked. I'd have been mad at those folks, right? But that's not how Jesus reacted, is it? I mean, not only did he go out to see the crowd, which I think is remarkable, but he was touched by them and started to cure their sick. He started to perform miracles. In other words, he cared so much for those folks. He experienced so much compassion for them. He felt so much love. Jesus sacrificed something he really needed. And that's that time away. You know, something that was important to him so that he could use his power to help others. Man, he just loved them. And if it wasn't clear enough at the beginning of the story, later on, he did the exact same sort of thing when he saw those same folks were hungry and gave them something to eat. Jesus just plain cared for people, right? And I'll tell you something, I believe that care as, is just as strong today as it was 2,000 years ago. You see, I still think Jesus has compassion for the world he came to save. And you know, that's really a cool thing. Because it sure seems to be nowadays that a lot of folks could use a few miracles right now. I mean, look around this part of the country. And I'm talking about the Ohio Valley. Man, there are plenty of people, and I'm talking about men and women, who've not only lost their jobs, but, but have lost their entire way of life. Man, everything in the valley changed. And I'm talking about people who have become so hopeless about not just the future, but about the present, that they will believe anybody who comes along and promises that he or she will make things the way they used to be, right? They're going to pull a Superman and they're going to turn the world back so we can live in a place that is probably gone forever. 
And I'll tell you, there are other people. And I'll tell you, they may be here right now. I may, I may be looking at them. Who right now feel so stressed out or so discouraged or so frustrated, they don't know what to do. Now, you won't know it by looking at them because they've learned to look real calm. But inside, in fact, there may be some folks here this morning who are totally and absolutely empty inside. For whatever reason. For them, God is a stranger. Maybe because of something that's happened in their lives. I don't know. For them, God's a stranger. Maybe even an enemy. And you know what Jesus is? Man, He is a, just a name in a book. I'll tell you, there are folks out he, there in the world and maybe right here in this community who are just plain lost physically or emotionally or spiritually. And if I'm talking about you or if I'm talking about somebody that you know and somebody that you love I want you to know that in spite of what you're facing Jesus Christ still cares. I'm going to say it again. In spite of what you're facing, Jesus Christ still cares. Man, He still feels compassion for you, and He feels compassion for me, and that help and wholeness and salvation are still available. Why? Because as long as Christ loves, divine miracles still happen. And in my book, that's the first thing we need to remember. And second, we're still called to be involved in miracles ourselves. In other words, God has still given us a role to play in accomplishing His miraculous will. And you know, that's the way it was in the passage we read. Particularly when you're talking about the feeding of the 5,000. I mean, when Jesus recognized that it was late in the day, you know, the sun was starting to go down, and the crowd was probably getting hungry, maybe he could hear, you know, the grumbling of tummies. I mean, Jesus could have miraculously made the people's hunger go away, couldn't he have? Couldn't he have made, just miraculously made the hunger go away? Or he could have miraculously made food, boom, appear in... 5,000 different stomachs, not including the women and the children. He could have done that, right? My gosh, we're talking about Jesus, Son of God, revelation of the divine. He could have miraculously given every single person there a McDonald's Happy Meal. Even though McDonald's didn't even exist. He's God for crying out loud. In fact, Jesus could have supersized it. But that's not what he did. Instead, when his disciples came and said to him, this place is deserted and the hour has already passed, release the crowds so that they can go into the villages and buy themselves food. Jesus said, they have no need to go. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. Now that's what he said. And then later, after he had taken, blessed, and broke the bread, the disciples not only passed it all out, but they collect, collected the scraps. You see, they were actively involved in the miracle. And I'll tell you, that's still the case today. In other words, in the face of a hungry world. I think Jesus still tells His disciples, who have more than enough, simply to give them something to eat. Man, if I've got five loaves of bread and my neighbor has none, I think God is whispering in my ear, give your neighbor something to eat. You see, I believe it's our responsibility to give food to the hungry. What a radical thought. And drink to the thirsty. 
to welcome the stranger and to clothe the naked, to care for the sick and to visit the prisoner. And it's certainly our job to make sure everybody knows that the body of Christ was broken for them. You see, just like the disciples with Jesus, we're called to be directly involved in the miraculous. And that's the second thing I think we need to remember. And third, to be actively involved. We still need to be open and willing to work. In other words, we've got we to be willing to do something. In other words, we need to be like the disciples in the story we read. Who were not only open enough to hear what Jesus said. I mean, man, they could have dismissed what he said. And just gone about their business. But were open to what he said. Not only that, but they were also willing to pass out the bread and clean up the mess later. And I'll tell you something. If we want to be part of the miraculous if we want to be part of those miracles that are taking place all around us, we're going to have to do the same thing ourselves. You see, even though it may hurt a little bit, we're going to need to open ourselves up to both the old and the familiar as well as the new and the different. I mean, give me a break. How are we ever going to do what Jesus is calling us to do, and I'm talking about right here and right now, if we absolutely refuse to learn from the past? Therefore, we're going to continue to make the same old mistakes. What? Over and over. Again. Over, thank you, and over again. And you tell me, how in heaven's name are we going to do anything in a new and changing world if we choose to do nothing that is new and different? Looking at two young men right there. How's the church going to do that? If we refuse to do anything that's different than what we've done in the past. How are we going to reach a new world? How are we going to reach if we refuse to adjust ourselves so that we can share the same gospel to a world that's a heck of a lot different than it was back in 1972? For the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the faith, we've got to be open to both the past and the future. And I'll tell you something else. We also have to be willing to roll up our sleeves and work. Sort of like the people did. The people here in your congregation, when you ran the uh, rummage sale y'all were talking about, you know, a few weeks ago. Man, y'all worked pretty hard to do that, didn't you? But I don't want single or the women who are always planning activities, you know, made that cake there, you know, a couple of months ago. But I don't want to single them out for just them for attention. That would be unfair. I mean, I believe there are plenty of people in this congregation, there are plenty of y'all here this morning, who are willing to roll up your sleeves because you do that. And you're willing to do whatever is necessary to get the job done. That's the wonder of small churches. Christian brothers and sisters who deserve to hear our encouragement and support rather than a lot of griping and criticizing and complaining. When they do roll up their sleeves and get the job done. I'll tell you, we, remember, we need to remember that it wasn't the disciples, but it was the scribes and the Pharisees who gave Jesus a hard time because he didn't do things their way. You see, we've got to be willing to be involved in the miracles. We've got to be willing to be involved. And that's the third thing we need to remember. Now, I think this whole idea of miracles will always be an uncomfortable fit in the modern world. We just don't know how to deal with them. I mean, on one hand, it, it cuts across the grain of people who believe that reason defines truth. 
On the other hand, we are probably going to still use the word when the impossible happens. When something totally unexpected occurs. When something beyond the imagination transpires. Let's say something like the Browns making the playoffs. No. Our society will probably continue to have an interesting relationship with miracles. But that doesn't have to be the case with us. Because we can remember that miracles still happen. And that we can still be involved in the miraculous. And if we want to play our role, if we want to be involved, we still need to be open and willing to work. And with all that said, let me ask you one question. Do you want to become part of a miracle? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, this is your word. This is your word. The miraculous has taken place all around us because you still love your creatures. Therefore, you care for us. And you've called us to be involved in some way in those miracles. And to do that, we need to be open to all kinds of possibilities and willing to work. Now help us answer the question. Do we really want to be a part of a miracle? Amen. Now, let's all stand and let's sing another hymn that uh, Joe selected, if you, you don't care for it. Uh, let's all stand and hear, sing hymn 444, Bring It In The Sheaves. Now, you got to like bringing in the sheaves, right? Okay, let's bring them in. Bringing in the 
Y'all may be seated. And I'll tell you, I am so glad I wore this seersucker suit today because what a better thing to wear uh, when you're singing Bringing in the Sheaves. Makes me feel like I'm down south again. Uh, How many people know what sheaves are? Sheaves are? Sheaves, sheaves are these little people that live on... <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what sheaves are. Well, um, in the old days when farmers bindered, the binder is a machine that's pulled either by horses or a tractor that cuts the grain and puts it into a bundle and ties it with twine. That is a sheaf. That is a sheaf and is carried by these little people who live... <laughs> No, those are Oompa Loompas, so that's not cheap. Uh, but, but thank you, Joe. That's, I didn't know that was an old Catholic song. It's not, it's not I see. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we come to the part of the service where we've got the opportunity to lift our prayers to God. Now, you got some concerns, needs in the bulletin. Uh, we certainly want to pray for our brother Bill, who sounds like he's getting uh, recovering really well, especially if he'll see you next week. That's a good thing. Are there any other uh, needs or concerns we want to remember today and into the next week? Anything else? Well, you know, that's a good thing, you know. But there are still issues that are weighing heavy on your heart. So let's go to God now in prayer, and I'll open and pray for a little bit. Then y'all will have the opportunity to lift the, uh, some of the concerns that are in the insert and those that weigh heavy on your heart up to God, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So let's go before God now in prayer. Lord God, before we say anything else, we want to give you a word of thanks for giving us such a wonderful day to gather in your name. Your presence is here. We believe it because we feel it and we know it. You're flowing around and through us and we are truly grateful. Now, just a little while ago, we heard your word read and proclaimed and about miracles. And so we ask that you help us recognize that they're occurring all around. We don't need more miracles. We just need to recognize the ones that are already happening. And we want to also want to ask you to help us remember that, that we have a part to play in those miracles. We are not impassive observers. Rather, we should be participants working within your will. So enable us to, to do that by, by being open and be, by being willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. So we ask for your guidance and direction in the name of Jesus Christ. And now in the privacy of our hearts, we're going to lift up to you those concerns that are on the insert. We're going to lift up to you those, those things that weigh heavy on our heart. Lord God, hear us now as we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to us. And of course, thank you for loving us as much as you do. But right now, we thank you for answering us. And we believe that you will because we've made these prayers in the name of Christ our Savior, who taught us to pray, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, would you all come on out front to collect our tithes and offering?
the offertory prayer found in your bulletins. We offer these gifts that your kingdom may take shape here on earth, and that we may also be shaped in the giving by the one whose very life is a gift to us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our departing hymn is Rejoice, You Pure in Heart, number seven. You see that last verse, verse number five. And I'm telling you one thing, I am, I am appreciating. This is an old hymnal, right? Yes. Man, people a long time ago had much better eyesight than I've got. This is pretty small print in here. I'm having a real tough time seeing it. But we're on verse number five, I think, right? Yes. Verse number five. Now, Mike, what does that, this verse end in? Amen! Okay, that's what it ends in. So, I stopped it because when we get there, the amen is... Amen. Right? But instead of singing, Amen, let's sing, Amen. Okay? You ready? On verse number five. Amen. All right, let's go. a round of applause. That was great. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, go now in peace. And be challenged to recognize the miraculous that is taking place all around you. And to recognize that you have a role to play when you're open and willing to do the work. And to inspire this walk, receive the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the people of God said, Amen! Amen.